We'll take our reading from St. Luke. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, who also stripped him, and having wounded him, went away, leaving him half dead. And it happened that a certain priest went down the same way, and seeing him passed by. In like manner also a Levite, when he was near the place and saw him, passed by. But a certain Samaritan, being on his journey, came near him, and seeing him was moved with compassion. And going up to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and setting him upon his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou shalt spend over and above, I at my return will repay thee. Which of these three, in thy opinion, was neighbor to him that fell amongst robbers? Again, words taken from St. Luke's Holy Gospel. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst robbers. Words taken from St. Luke's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In November of 2001, CIA agent Johnny Spann was sorting through a group of prisoners. Over 300 Taliban soldiers had been captured. And Mr. Spann was trying to determine which of them was actually members of the Al-Qaeda terrorist group. Eventually, Mr. Spann spotted a prisoner that looked like a Westerner, perhaps from the United States or from Europe. Eventually, the CIA agent began to ask questions, and just how did a person from the West, from the United States, end up fighting for the Taliban against our country? The prisoner's Muslim name was Suleiman Alind, a young man. But his first name, his original name, was John Walker Lind, a young man from California who had been baptized and raised by his Roman Catholic parents. This young man, who has been called Johnny Jihad, Johnny Ben Walker, and the Taliban American is still serving out his 20-year sentence. His lawyer stated that Mr. Walker spends his day learning Arabic and reading the Quran. Well, I would like to ask the question asked by Johnny Spann, that CIA agent, just how the heck did Johnny Lind Walker end up becoming the Taliban American? Well, John was born in February of 1981 to Frank Lind, a worker at the U.S. Department of Justice, and to his mom, Marilyn Walker, who was a stay-at-home mom. He was brought up with his two siblings in Silver Springs, Maryland, where they attended church at St. Bernadette's Church, which was the church of his baptism. Of course, he wasn't named after John the Baptist or John the Evangelist, but rather was named after the rock star, John Lennon. Eventually, John and his whole family moved out west they moved out to California to the very progressive area known as Marin County. And there, John was sent to an alternative school where his learning, his academics, was largely self-directed. And so without teachers providing him proper structure, Johnny Ben Walker, Johnny Lind, ended up studying Islamic culture, Islamic art, and Arabic. His religious training, unfortunately, was also largely self-directed. One of the friends of the family said that Marilyn Walker, the mother, opened up all those doors to her kids instead of dragging them into Catholicism. Marilyn left the church when John turned 13, and she became a Buddhist. And as for his dad, 
Well, Franklin, he embraced, shall we say, an alternative lifestyle, a San Francisco way of living, if you will. Eventually, John Walker Lind, who had neither been introduced to the great mysteries of our holy faith, nor been given the great spiritual treasures of Christ to fill his need, became a Muslim at 16 years old. And so on every Friday, every Friday evening, John Walker Lind would change out of his Western clothes and would don Islamic robes in order to attend prayer services at the local mosque. And as for his parents, Franklin, the father, was proud of his son's newfound dedication to the religion of Islam, and he thought that his quote-unquote conversion had been good for him. As for the mother, Maryland, she was a little bit concerned, not that he become a Muslim, but that he was getting just a little bit too religious. The parents did not seem overly concerned that their child was apostatizing, that he was rejecting ultimately the entire revelation of Jesus Christ and following a false and demonically inspired religion filled with error, darkness, superstition. Instead of challenging him and confronting him out of love, Frank and Marilyn fell prey to that error that so many parents in the West fall to today, religious indifferentism. It doesn't really matter what religion you are. At least he's going to church somewhere. At least he's going to synagogue. In this great era of religious indifferentism, one religion is seen as good as any other in terms of bringing one to heaven and perfection. But the case of John Walker Lind is tragic, truly a tragedy. Here was a boy that hungered for spiritual truth and religious things. So committed was he to Islam that he moved off to the Middle East and eventually to Pakistan when he was only 18 years old. He wanted to live the life of a Muslim in an extraordinary way. Think of the capacity he had within him to love God and to live a godly and even religious life. He would have been an incredible Catholic, maybe even a religious brother, a monk, or a priest. That is, if only he had been raised in the faith he was baptized in. Now, I wonder, I wonder if John's parents went to Mass with their children every Sunday or on special feast days during the week like Candle Mass. I wonder if they went to Vespers, evening prayer, or benediction services. I wonder if they prayed the rosary together as a family. I wonder if they read the Holy Bible or perhaps encouraged John and his siblings to read the lives of the saints or to read the classical literature of the church, the writings of Augustine, Aquinas, and St. Teresa of Jesus. I wonder if John received all the sacraments of initiation, especially confirmation. I wonder if Catholicism was ever a topic at the dinner table. I wonder if they visited religious sites as a family, went on pilgrimage, not to Saudi Arabia, but to all those mission churches along the California coast, or perhaps even to Rome, the very center of the church. In short, I wonder if John Walker Lynn, Johnny Jihad, Johnny Ben Walker, or the Taliban American, was ever given the full riches and treasure that is the Catholic faith. And the answer, as we know, is no. And that is tragic. Having not been given the treasure, the pearl of great price, which is the Catholic faith, John searched elsewhere, and he found only the costume jewelry of a counterfeit religion. Now, John Walker Lind was not a victim of Muslim fundamentalism. He was not a victim of Osama bin Laden or the Ayatollah Khomeini. 
No, John Walker Lind was a victim, was a casualty of the rebellion that has happened in the once Christian West. A liberal, rebellious spirit that has embraced secularism and has rejected the Christian past, its Christian roots. It's rejected the order that God has willed. Where Christ is king of society, his holy gospel is law, and his church is favored. In short, John had been robbed. At open this conference, I read to you about a great robbery, a story of thieves, a fallen man, and a good Samaritan. Now, this story, so beautifully recounted by a dearest Lord, has a very deep spiritual meaning, which goes beyond just loving one's neighbor or even loving one's enemy. You see, according to the great teachers of our holy faith, the church fathers especially, this parable points to the very mystery of our salvation. So allow me to do just a little bit of a short Bible study to pull out some of the spiritual gems from that parable that the fathers of the church found in the past. The parable begins saying that a man fell prey to robbers. That man, dear people, is Adam, our father. And who are the ones, the robbers, who steal from him? They are the devils, Satan, who strip him of his grace, which is a share in God's divine life. And where is the man heading? So important. The man is heading away from Jerusalem and is going towards Jericho. Now, Jerusalem was seen as God's resting place. It was a city of peace. It was a holy city, a city that was elevated some 1,300 feet above sea level. Whereas Jericho has always signified an evil city, an evil city whose walls were knocked down by God and by the Israelites as they marched around those walls, blowing their horns, screaming in praise of God until the walls came tumbling down. No, Jericho is an evil city. It is a symbol of the spirit of the flesh, the spirit of the world. It's a city of spiritual blindness, which Bartimaeus hangs out right outside. And its location is literally in the lowest spot on earth. The lowest city on earth, nearly 900 feet below sea level. The Jewish priests pass by, then a Jewish Levite pass by, but they can't do anything to help the victim. For the old covenant was incomplete. It was imperfect. It cannot save anybody, including the Jews. Only Christ Jesus and his new covenant can heal the wound of sin with the gift of grace. But who is this good Samaritan? It is Christ Jesus. But wait a minute. Isn't the Samaritan the one who is an enemy of the Jews, an enemy of God's people? How could Christ be seen then as the Samaritan? It's because after the fall of Adam... We were enemies of God. We were under the curse of original sin. We were at odds with the Most High. St. Paul says that we were children of wrath. Christ, therefore, is a true Samaritan because he loved us and cared for us even when we were his enemies. And yes, the good Samaritan poured oil and wine into the wounds of the fallen man. How sacramental is that? Oil, matter for the sacrament of extreme unction. Wine, matter that will become literally the most precious blood at the altar at the words of consecration. The bandages that he's wrapped with represent the sacrament of confession. And yes, the man is then placed on a beast of burden. And that beast of burden carries him. That is a symbol of Christ's sacred humanity. For he took upon himself all of our sins, as well as his cross, and hiked up Mount Calvary to die for us. And finally, the man is taken to an inn, a safe place 
an image of the Catholic Church herself. The Good Samaritan then gives responsibility to the innkeeper who has the keys. Take care of him, St. Peter. Take care of him, the Church of God, until I come back in my second coming. Now, it is interesting. Whenever the Catholic Church is described in the Holy Bible, it is always pictured in very visible ways because it is a visible church that has a presence on this earth. The church is the ark of salvation. She is Noah's ark that will get us through the flood of corruption. She is the bark of Peter because Christ always chooses Peter's boat to go upon. She is the vineyard of the Lord. She is the temple with many living stones. She is the bride of Christ and his mystical body. You see, the Son of God, he became visible. He became sensible so that men could find him and be saved. And so his Catholic Church has to be sensed by mankind so that she can be searched for, she can be found and eventually join for all those who seek the truth in goodwill. Men are mere creatures. We're made up of body and soul, and all information comes to us beginning through the senses. That's why there's no such thing as an invisible church. That is the error of Protestantism. There is a visible church, a church that was visible like Christ, that can be seen, it can be heard, it can be sensed. And that's why we say the church has marks. The marks that we recite at every Sunday Mass at the Creed. The marks that we're here at the Creed this evening. She is one, she is holy, she is Catholic, she is apostolic, she is a society with visible membership. And yes, she has sensible sacraments. And yes, a governing structure. And with this in mind, let me provide for you perhaps the best definition of the church that exists. A definition given to us by St. Robert Bellarmine, the great Jesuit. St. Robert Bellarmine once said, quote, The church is the congregation of men bound together by their profession of the one Christian faith. You must have the Christian faith completely to be a member of the church. Number two, bound together by the communion of the same sacraments, beginning with baptism, must be baptized to be a member of the church. And finally, under the rule of the legitimate pastors, the shepherds, especially the vicar of Christ on earth, the Roman pontiff. In reality, then, this church of Christ can be found by those who are willing to search. And as the old Latin phrase said, ubi petrus ibi ecclesia. Where there is Peter, there is the church, and Peter is in Rome. But I have to admit, one of my favorite images, visible images of the church, the Catholic church, is she is the mountain of God. In the book of the prophet Daniel, we are told that Daniel's gift of interpreting dreams, including his interpretation of a dream that was had by a king, a Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if you remember from your Bible stories, King Nebuchadnezzar dreamt of an enormous statue. The enormous statue had a head of gold, had a chest and arms that were silver, had thighs and legs that were bronze, and then iron feet, and then iron mixed with clay towards the very bottom of the statue. Then in the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, there was a rock, a pebble really, that is cut from the mountain by the hand of God and falls upon the feet of the statue and breaks those feet into pieces, and then all the iron and the bronze and the silver and the gold head of the statue fall to the ground into pieces like chaff before the wind. The rock, this little pebble, 
that crushed all these statues. This rock, this pebble becomes a great mountain which fills the entire earth. And with divine enlightenment, Daniel explains that the various secular empires and worldly kingdoms symbolized by that statue are bound to fail. But eventually Daniel prophesies that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, but it shall stand forever. And it shall break into pieces all the secular kingdoms and will bring them to an end. Now, what is Daniel talking about? He's speaking first and foremost about the Son of God. The Son of God who is the stone rejected by the builders that has become the cornerstone, the cornerstone of a new temple, a temple of his body, the kingdom of God on earth, the Holy Roman Catholic Church also built upon the rock of St. Peter, whose very name means rock. It is a king that will last forever. Nothing can destroy it. Not even the gates of hell shall prevail against it. And this stone, Christ and his Catholic Church will grow. And they will become a great mountain covering the whole earth, providing both Jew and and Gentile, the one and only connection to the summit of heaven. But today, today we hear in the modern world about the beauty of religious pluralism. Religious diversity, we're told, is a strength of ours. The fact that on one city street you might find a Presbyterian or Lutheran assembly hall, as well as a synagogue and maybe a mosque, and then a Catholic parish. This is all seen as wonderful, sort of like a rainbow of various religions. But do we really think that the good Lord, who is one God, who sent one Savior to establish one kingdom with one saving message, do you think he desires such pluralism, with falsehood being part of this equation, with religious error being put on the same level as Catholic truth? Of course not. Rather, he tolerates, he permits this evil of division, knowing that one day, one day there will be manifested to all one flock and one shepherd fully accomplished and fully shown to the world in the Catholic Church, and the vicar of Christ, the Pope. You see, our God, dear people, the Bible calls him El Shaddai. El Shaddai means the God of the mountain. He is the God atop of Mount Moriah, who receives willingly the sacrifice that Abraham was willing to offer of his own son. Yes, he's the God of Mount Sinai, who gives Moses the Ten Commandments. He's the God of Mount Carmel who helps and answers the prayers of Elias the prophet and destroys the false prophets of Baal. And yes, he is the God of Mount Calvary, who laid down his life in atonement for our sins. Our God, El Shaddai, now sits on top of a mountain, the Catholic Church, which is the one and only elevation that can bring mankind to heaven. You see... The high ridge mountains that surrounded the old Jerusalem are no longer blessed by God. For the old Israel is no longer the people of God. Now the good Lord sits enthroned, especially in the new Jerusalem, the new Israel, the kingdom, the mountain of God on earth, the church of Rome, with its seven hills, its seven sacraments, so allow me just to give you a little tidbit from history to show how God's people switched from the Middle East to Rome. In the year 70 AD, a Roman general named Titus defeated the Jews in a war. General Titus then returned to Rome 
in triumph with all the spoils of his victory over the Jews. And what he actually brought back to Rome is known to history because of a monument, a carved monument called the Arch of Titus. Many scenes of that victory over the Jews are shown carved in stone, including the taking of Jewish spoils, the sacred menorah, that holy candelabra from the temple, as well as the golden table that held the showbread, were taken from Jerusalem and brought to the city of Rome. The temple books, the Torah, as well as the veil of the temple, as well as the silver trumpets that called the Jews to prayer, all taken from the Holy Land and brought to Rome. And finally, the marble and the stone from the temple itself were used to build many Roman cities in the Middle East. And yes, the Romans, which are always hungry for new building materials, would even bring some of those stones to Rome itself. But what happened to a few of those stones once they were brought to Rome? What happened to all those spoils of war? Well, archaeologists have determined that these spoils of war, these riches, were used to build the Colosseum in Rome. In fact, some of the stones from the temple itself have been found in the walls of the Colosseum. Yes, at one time the temple had been a place where sheep and bulls were offered in sacrifice, but now a few of these same stones would be used to help build an arena where early Catholic martyrs would be sacrificed. But as we know, the victory of Titus and the pagan Romans was short-lived. You see, a Jewish man named Simon Barjona would come to the Eternal City. Yes, a man who would receive the name Peter from the lips of Christ himself, as well as the keys to the kingdom, would come with followers of the way to convert Rome and eventually the entire Roman Empire to the Catholic faith. What a conversion from the center of the Gentile world, from being a city of man, from being a Babylon that drank in the blood of the saints. Rome became the city of God and the new Jerusalem. The church of Rome is the brain of the church. The church of Rome is the capital of the universal church. The church of Rome is the very cradle of the church. She is the mother, the mother church in all local churches, including that of Fort Wayne and South Bend, are but her daughters. Now, seeing the Roman Catholic Church as the one and only mountain of God, as the one and only stairway that allows us to ascend upwards to heaven, is quite different from the way that modern people view religion. You see, the modern view of religion today is best expressed by Muhammad Ali, a Christian who became a black Muslim. Muhammad Ali, the famous boxer, once said, quote, religion is like water. There are different bodies of water, streams, lakes, rivers, ponds, oceans, but in the end, it's all water. And so there are different religious groups, Ali says, with different viewpoints, but in the end, it's all the same religion, unquote. Again, what we have here is the problem of John and Marilyn Walker, the problem of religious indifferentism which plagues the Catholic faithful, where all religions are seen as equal and equally equipped to perfect men and bring them to heaven. This great error always leads, practically speaking, to atheism. Western culture becomes atheistic, practically speaking, since all religions are supposedly equally equipped, with no one religion being the true one, the state and the population of the country begin to see religion as opinions, a religion as being unimportant and unnecessary. But the devil knows there's only one mountain, 
Only one mountain of God, and so he wishes to confuse us who live in the valley here below. The smog of Jericho so blinds us, causing many people to climb false summits that only bring one to the abyss. Not too long ago, I was in Louisville, Kentucky, where I met a person who announced to me that she was a member of the Happy Church. I said to her, the Happy Church, where is that located? She says, oh, it's in southern Indiana. And then the woman went on to tell me that the Happy Church that she belonged to was non-denominational. Well, I stopped her there, and I said, well, it must be a Catholic parish, this happy church, because the Catholic church is non-denominational. She, the Catholic church, is not and never has been a denomination. The Catholic church is the one and only church founded by our Lord Jesus Christ in the year 33 AD upon the rock of Peter. And unlike a denomination, the Catholic Church doesn't see herself as a branch of the tree. She has an absolute monopoly upon all saving truth and saving graces. Outside of her, as the Church teaches, there is no saving truth, no saving grace, and no true worship of God. There is one Lord. There is one faith. There's one baptism. There's one God and Father of all and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And yes, there is one church that he founded. The church is not like a tree with a series of branches representing various religious groups. But again, the devil has sown the erroneous seed of denominationalism into the minds of most Western Catholics who see Christianity or religion in general as if it were like Major League Baseball or the NFL, with various religious teams sharing in the game of salvation. But dear people, there is only one team in the game of salvation, and that is the Catholic Church. And that is why people have come into the Catholic Church in the past. Converts have left their errors and entered into the church looking for truth and salvation. And such a convert was Edmund Campion. Edmund Campion was the son of wealthy parents. Edmund Campion went to the best schools in England in the 16th century. And he became one of the greatest speakers and teachers in all the British Isles. Queen Elizabeth I, that heretical and illegitimate daughter of the infamous King Henry VIII, viewed Edmund Campion as one of the diamonds of England. The Queen listened to his speeches with rapt interest and lavished upon him the greatest honors and even placed him under the care of the Chancellor of all England. Edmund made, however, a sinful mistake. He embraced the errors of the Church of England in order to promote his brilliant career. He eventually was, quote-unquote, ordained as a deacon by an Anglican bishop. But then the Holy Ghost intervened, and things started to change for the better. You see, Edmund began to study history. One cannot study history and remain a Protestant. Edmund began to study the Christian writings of the past, the church fathers, and having read the teachings of these great men of old, Edmund slowly but surely began to realize his own religious errors. Filled with guilt, filled with remorse, Edmund sought out a Catholic priest. He renounced his heresy and he made a good confession. And he was publicly assumed his state now as a son of Holy Mother Church. This cost him everything. It cost him not only his brilliant career, but also his physical safety within his own country. 
Off he went then to Ireland and eventually to France, where he would study for the holy priesthood, and he would be ordained a Jesuit priest. Father Edmund Campion desired then to return to his native soil in order to spread the true faith and to bring people back to the church. And during his formation, Father Campion prayed for the grace, the blessing of being a martyr, dying for the faith. The mission that Father Campion had in England was to bring back lost sheep and to reclaim Catholics that had wavered under the evil regime of Queen Elizabeth I. He and other Jesuit priests snuck into England. They used disguises. They used fake names. They had hiding places, priest holes. And yes, Edmund and others served persecuted Catholics by offering the mass in hiding, hearing their confessions, anointing their dying, and being a witness to their marriages. But while in hiding, Father Campion also wrote his most famous work, a book, a pamphlet really called The Ten Reasons. And in this pamphlet, he proved the Catholic faith to be true and Protestantism to be false. The Ten Reasons publication spread rapidly throughout the whole country, and the Queen herself offered a large monetary reward for the capture and eventual arrest of Father Edmund Campion. On the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, July 16, 1581, Father Campion was offering Holy Mass in a house of a Catholic family. A government spy was in attendance, and like the infamous Judas of old, that spy left immediately after receiving Holy Communion in order to inform the police. After being arrested, Father Campion was brought to the Tower of London, where he was then interrogated and tortured on the rack. And during his imprisonment there, Queen Elizabeth herself visited his jail cell and promised him freedom, liberty, honors, and even an appointment as an Anglican bishop if he would renounce his Catholicism and acknowledge her as the head of the Church of England. But this fearless man flatly refused to offer himself in that way. He did not embrace the temptation of this temptress, but he kept the faith. Soon a mock trial was held that condemned Edmund Campion to death by being hung, drawn, and quartered. On a cold December day, a crowd gathered at the city gates of London through which the condemned prisoners would pass. Father Edmund spoke to the crowd in the following way. God save you all, he said, and may he make all of you one day good Catholics. As he reached the Tyburn, the notorious gallows where hundreds of Catholics were martyred for the true faith, Father Campion had a noose placed around his neck. His last statement to his executioners was memorable. If being a Catholic is to be a traitor, then I confess that I am one. You see, in condemning Campion to death, Queen Elizabeth and her followers were condemning their entire Christian past and all their Christian ancestors. St. Edmund Campion then surrendered his soul as a martyr of faithfulness to the faith and to the Pope of Rome. After the martyrdom of St. Edmund Campion, the Anglicans would eventually put forth a very strange and false theological theory, which became known as the branch theory. To this day, the branch theory holds that the Roman Catholic Church the Eastern Orthodox, and the Anglican Assembly are three principal branches of the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Although the Church may have become divided, the theory says, each branch was still on the tree of Christ.
this theory soon evolved into the notion that there were countless Christian denominations that all belonged, that all participated in the one church of Christ, like branches on a tree. The church then became a tower of Babel with a diversity of faith traditions and doctrines. And then an ecumenical movement would have to arise trying to put this Humpty Dumpty-like church back together again, agreeing to disagree, accepting error as well as truth. This theory of a divided church, when we pray every Sunday we believe in one church, this theory of a divided church is not only foolishness, but it's blasphemy. St. Edmund Campion was not only a martyr for Christ and the true church, but he was a convert, a man who turned away from his error and embraced the Catholic faith. Through the grace of God, Edmund realized that unity with Christ could only be found when one is united to his mystical body, which is the Catholic Church. There, there is one language of faith. It is the church of the upper room of Pentecost Sunday, which brought an end to the reign of the Tower of Babel. Again, the church, the Catholic Church, is not a denomination. Rather, she is the one church, the one and only mystical body of Christ, the one kingdom of God on earth. Catholicism is Christianity. Christianity is Catholicism. They are synonymous terms. Only Catholics have the fullness of the Christian faith. No one who dissents from the church and its teachings can be truly, fully participating in the Christian faith. In one of his great papal letters, Pope Leo XIII taught the following, quote, So long as the member of the church was in its body, that member of the church lived. But when separated from the body of the church, it lost its life. Pope Leo continued, Thus the man, so long as he lives on the body of the Catholic Church, he is a Christian. Separated from her, he becomes a heretic, unquote. Oftentimes today, strange things come forth from the mouth even of Catholics. You will hear Catholics, even priests, refer to themselves as Catholic Christians. I'm a Catholic Christian. Now, granted, this is a very ancient term that was meant to distinguish Catholic Christians from those who were heretics. That's true. But today, the term Catholic Christian has taken on some erroneous meanings, as if we're just one element of the life of the church, as would be a Lutheran Christian or a Baptist Christian. Catholic Christian, therefore, is a ridiculous term. It is an utterly redundant title, as if I said, I'm a Christian Christian. A true Christian, a Catholic, has the faith, whereas non-Catholics objectively don't have the faith at all. If you ask a non-Catholic, do you believe that Mary was conceived without original sin? They will say, no, she was a sinner like us. That's blasphemy. Do they have the faith, objectively speaking, when they deny the immaculate conception of the mother of God? Do they believe in the real, substantial, true, even physical presence of Christ and the Holy Eucharist? No, they don't. They reject the entire priesthood. They reject the entire sacramental system. The common doctor... St. Thomas Aquinas said the following to give us some sense today. St. Thomas Aquinas taught it is foolishness to say that a heretic believes in Jesus Christ. To believe in a person is to give our full consent to his word and to everything he teaches. 
True faith, therefore, is absolute belief in Jesus Christ and in all he taught. And St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest teacher of our faith, St. Thomas Aquinas then concludes, he who does not adhere to all that Jesus Christ taught for our salvation has no more doctrine of Jesus and his church than do the pagans, the Jews, and the Muslims, unquote. And let us put to rest this error so present today which suggests that somehow the Orthodox, the Protestants, and Evangelicals are somehow members or a part of the church. To be a member of the church, we already know, you must be baptized, you must hold the entire Catholic faith, and you must be under the legitimate shepherds, the Pope, and the bishops in union with him. Without those conditions, one is not a member of the church. Only one mountain, only one mountain, dear people, reaches to heaven, and that mountain is the Catholic Church. And this one mountain is completely identical to and the exact same thing as the Catholic Church. And as I preach here this evening, I am teaching and giving you the same message which the Church has always given. The mystical body is the Catholic Church. The Church of Christ is identical to the Catholic Church. As St. Augustine once said, the greatest of all church fathers, St. Augustine said, no man can find salvation except in the Catholic Church. One can find everything but salvation outside the Catholic Church. One can have honor, one can have sacraments, one can sing amen, one can have faith even in the Trinity. But never can one find salvation except in the Catholic Church, unquote. This is our faith. This is what drove men to all the corners of the earth to bring people into the kingdom. And because we've lost that sense that Christ and his church are necessary for salvation, our missionary efforts have failed in the last few decades. And souls remain in darkness and are damned as a result. I recently heard a talk given by a Catholic priest where the priest stated that the Catholic Church, the true church founded by Christ, was the best means, the best way of coming to heaven. And the crowd listening to this talk was impressed by its apparent orthodoxy. The priest then went on to say that the Catholic Church was the easiest way of coming through the pearly gates of heaven, kind of like a Cadillac limousine smoothly driving you to that paradise above. But then he said, but for non-Catholics... For Protestants or for non-Christians, they have less means of salvation. They're like driving a spiritual Yugo or a spiritual Pinto or maybe a rackety old moped. At first hearing, this sounds so orthodox, such a wonderful analogy, but it is erroneous. The Roman church is not just the best means of coming to salvation. It is the only means, the only way. Christ didn't say, I am one of many ways. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, no one, no one comes to the Father except through me. And you can't separate Christ from his body, which is the church. And so to correct the priest's analogy, there's only one vehicle one train, one boat that can transport men to heaven. And as blessed Pius IX infallibly taught, it is to be held by faith that outside the apostolic Roman church, no one can be saved. And then Pius IX added, telling us to Catholics today, perhaps, in the future, it is a sin to believe 
that there is salvation outside the Catholic Church. Quotation, blessed, pious, the ninth. It is a sin to believe that salvation happens outside of Christ and the Catholic Church. Now, in conclusion, I want to be careful on how you interpret what I have said here this evening. I am not here tonight to condemn anyone to hell, but rather to inform. As a Catholic priest and as Catholic laity that you are, we are bound. Bound to bring the good news and to provide others with the truth. I am bound to accept the order of things that God has established, where Christ is king. And he established a kingdom called the Catholic Church to collect all the scattered children of Adam and to bring them back home. But Christ Jesus is the judge. He knows the hearts of all men. God is not completely bound by the sacraments. We leave those who have died to the mercy of God. But if anyone is saved... They are saved through Christ and his body, which is the church. And this is what Edmund Campion believed. This is what the saints believed. The church is the one mountain of God that connects heaven and earth. She's the one bride of Christ, his one kingdom, and his one temple. She is the upper room of Pentecost Sunday. Christ's prayer that all may be one has already been answered by the Father. Therefore, let us climb. Let us climb this one mountain and find perfection and salvation in Christ through his body. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.